Good afternoon and welcome to our Women in Politics event general session. We are so grateful for your time to join us. My name is Matt Carpenter and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at El Pomar Foundation. I have a wife who served uh, 30 years in the military, recently retired, and also two daughters. So opportunities like this to discuss and encourage women to be civically engaged is very important to me. This event wouldn't be possible without our partners. Back in 2002, El Pomar Foundation created the Forum for Civic Advancement with the goal of seeking and supporting those interested in contributing to the civic health of Colorado. Our other partners are the Colorado Municipal League, which represents the interests of nearly every municipality in Colorado through advocacy, information, and training. If you wanna learn more about CML and Colorado Municipal Government, please visit their website at cml.org. We're also very fortunate to have Colorado 5050 as a partner. It's a statewide nonpartisan educational group that believes office holders, whether elected or appointed, should more closely reflect the population. Colorado 5050 promotes diverse women's leadership through events, trainings, advocacy, and social media. To learn more and volunteer with them, please visit their website at colorado5050.org. As you can see, we have some amazing panelists, but before you get to meet them, I want to introduce you to our moderator, Sally Clark. Most recently, she was the Colorado State Director of the USDA Rural Development. She's also served as the El Paso County Commissioner. And while as a commissioner, she was the chair of the Board of Commission. And at that time, she also served on the National Association of Counties Board not only being on the executive committee, but also the president. And if that wasn't enough, prior to being a county commissioner, Sally served on the city of Colorado Springs Council. So I think we have a great moderator to guide us in our discussions and in our learnings. So please welcome Sally Clark to lead us. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much, Matt. And welcome to everyone uh, in this session today on women in politics with the Forum for Civic Advancement a program for the El Pomar Foundation. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Um, we have with us Congresswoman Diana DeGette, uh, Representative Iman Judah, Representative Stephanie Luck, and City Councilor Liz Hensley with us. Um, I'm going to read just a brief bio and then they're gonna take a couple of minutes to tell us a little bit about why they got into politics and how they ended up in elected office and um, tell us a little bit more about themselves. So Congresswoman Diana DeGette, Diana DeGette represents a Colorado's first congressional district and has established herself as a leader here in Colorado and on the national stage. She proudly stands on the front lines for progressive change on healthcare, reproductive rights, climate change, consumer protection, and the environment. Diana serves on the powerful Committee on Energy and Commerce, where she has leveraged her leadership position to improve healthcare, expand medical research, reform corporate business and accounting practices, ensure that our homeland is adequately protected, take on global climate change and move America towards energy independence. Diana is married to attorney Lena Lipinski and they have two daughters, Rafaela and Francesca and a dog named Charlie. So welcome Congresswoman. We'd love to hear a couple of minutes about you and uh, what you think is important for folks to know that are listening. Thank you so much, Sally, and it's great to see you. I was mentioning before, I've um, worked with Sally over the years when she was the county commissioner, and we would often meet in Washington, D.C. It's great to see you. I want to thank El Pomar and its partners for sponsoring this very important conversation about women in politics. Uh, as you heard from Sally, I've been in politics now for quite a number of years. I was in the Colorado legislature for four years before I was elected to Congress. And um, uh, I, like most women, I would bet, I never planned to have a career in politics. What happened with me, 
um, when I was a very young girl, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer so that I could help, um, I could help impact social change. And in fact, I did go to law school at New York University School of Law on a public interest scholarship. When I came back to Denver, I started practicing law. And then I sort of just, just lucked into volunteering on political campaigns. And I, um, and over time, I realized that I could help clients one at a time as a lawyer, or I could help write laws that would help large groups of people if I ran for office. And so I decided um, when my longtime male state representative, and that, at that time they didn't have term limits in the state legislature, he had been there 27 years. And when he decided to retire, I, um, I jumped into the race. I was 36 years old. I had a, no, no, wait, I was, yeah, I was 30, 36 years old and I had a young daughter. And, but I, my husband said, you have to do it. And so I ran for the legislature and then I had my second daughter in between the regular session in 1992 and the special session in 1993. And so she was six weeks old when we started that my next session. And then what happened was I actually did find that by working in a bipartisan fashion, I was able to pass really important health uh, or all kinds of legislation. But one thing I passed was environmental legislation to clean up brownfield sites which are like old gas stations and dry cleaners. And, and this bill, the Voluntary Redevelopment and Cleanup Act is still being used today to clean up thousands of environmentally contaminated sites in Colorado. And it was completely bipartisan. So in 1996, the longtime Congresswoman for the first congressional district, Pat Schroeder announced that she was retiring. And my husband again said, you've got to run. I said, do you know what this means for you? Because my daughters were two and six. And so, so he said, yes, you have to do it. So I did. And I have found in Congress, um, the same thing is, if you're really focused on policy, which I find most women in politics on both sides of the aisle are, then you really can achieve great things. And I'll just give you one example of many things I've worked on. But in 2016, I worked on a bill with Congressman Fred Upton from Michigan, a Republican, and it's called 21st Century Cures. It restructured the way we do biomedical research at the National Institutes of Health, and then the way we do drug and device approval at the um, FDA. And it revolutionized medical research and has been incredibly successful. It's, it's one of the reasons why uh, the Trump administration was able to do Operation Warp Speed to get the, the approval, the research and the approval for the coronavirus vaccine, the procedures we had put in place. And so um, now Fred and I are working again on a new initiative called ARPA-H, which is it's like DARPA, but for healthcare to help figure out ways we can have collaboration with uh, our public health institutions, our research universities, and private business to uh, tackle things like cancer, Alzheimer's, and diabetes. And so I found it to be incredibly, um, an incredibly satisfying career where I can really get things done as a woman. And I'll just say as a footnote, and then I'll turn it back to you, Sally, those two little girls who were two and six when I went to Congress, now they're 27 and 31. And as near as I can, my older daughter is a doctor and the younger one is at CU Law School. And as near as I can tell, they have suffered none the worse for wear by having a mother who's been in elected office all these years. And that to me, is the biggest achievement that I have had in my career. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for also being here. Uh, now I'm going to introduce State Representative uh, Iman Judah. Um, she is the representative for House District 41 in Aurora, Colorado. As a first-generation American born to Palestinian immigrants and refugees, 
She has called Colorado and specifically House District 41 home her entire life. As the first Muslim and Arab woman elected to the Colorado State Legislature, she's pas passionate about social justice work and advocates for criminal justice reform, universal health care, fighting the rising cost of health care, increasing access to jobs and education, and ensuring equal and civil rights for all, and combating our climate crisis. Iman is the founder and executive director of the locally based nonprofit Meet Meet the Middle East, MTME, which fosters relationships between the U.S. and the Middle East through education and immersion travel. Uh, in her free time, she enjoys cooking, spending time with her large family, and fly fishing the beautiful rivers of Colorado. Welcome, Representative Judah. Thank you, and thank you for having me this evening. And it's an honor to be here with Congresswoman Deget and uh, my fellow member, Representative Leck. Um, Rep Leck and I are, are two new incoming members, so it's always nice to uh, see that face uh, in these spaces. Um, yeah, like uh, Ms. Clark said, my name is Iman Judah, and I'm the representative for the 41st House District in Aurora. Um, and, you know, I think, quite frankly, when you hold my identity markers, uh, like the introduction says, um, you are kind of you kind of inherit advocacy. Um, I am a first generation American. I am the daughter of immigrants and refugees. Um, I am a practicing Muslim. I'm a woman of color. And so all of these different identity markers allow me to have a different lens when it comes to not only my legislation, but to my advocacy my entire life. Um, from a very, very early age, some of my first memories were in fact advocating for those less fortunate. And I'm very fortunate to come from a family who believes in advocacy and, 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 and defending those less fortunate. Um, and oftentimes that manifests itself through education, which is why I gravitated uh, towards establishing a nonprofit that was really centered around education, as well as teaching at the University of Denver about the Middle East and Islam. Um, I'm also the first female spokesperson for the largest and oldest mosque in the Rocky Mountain region, which is also located in HD 41. Um, and I grew up going to that mosque. My father was one of the co-founders. So it's a great way to continue that family legacy. Um, and, you know, uh, one thing I will say is uh, throughout my advocacy, I've, I've been at the Capitol now really for six years um, as an advocate. Uh, through the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, through the Colorado Muslim Leadership Council, through Meet the Middle East, um, and, and really uh, putting myself in spaces where decisions were being made and using my identity as a way to be in these spaces, but not as a box to be checked, but rather to, in fact, influence policy and to make sure that our voices, which were traditionally marginalized or underrepresented, uh, were in fact represented in these decisions. And, you know, my, my path to politics Thank really so just started um, with you essentially, know, sorry, um, really just started with um, me finding out that there was legislation in the Capitol that I should probably go say something about that piece of legislation. And oftentimes it was uh, through the lens of a Muslim or through a Muslim woman, um, I am really sorry, this is really loud. Um, and so um, when I would go testify on these bills, whether it was you know, equal pay for equal work, should women get paid the same as men in Colorado, um, you know, bringing this different lens to the legislature allowed lawmakers to see me as, you know, here's someone who can educate us about um, her background while simultaneously dispelling a lot of stereotypes, myths, and preconceived notions about what it is to be Arab, what it is to be a Muslim woman. Um, and, and that piece of legislation in particular was interesting because, you know, I, I went to that committee hearing and I said, you know, 1400 years ago, God put in the Quran that I will always reward you for equal pay. Sorry, I will always reward you equally, regardless of your gender for the same work. And you know, this is coming from a part of the world that is often viewed as primitive or backwards. And um, knowing that there are 14 democratically elected women heads of state in the Muslim world, 
um, you know, gives me pause knowing that it took until 2020 to first elect our first woman to the executive branch in the United States. Um, and so as I was in these spaces, right, whether it was with the attorney general or consulting with children's hospital or teaching in the front, in front of the class at DU, um, I was able to bring this level of, of advocacy, bring a lens that wasn't really heard before and allow lawmakers to say, wow, we actually have a shared value here and maybe my preconceived notions about Islam, about women, um, about the Middle East, about this community uh, isn't in, in fact correct. And so by the time it came time for me to uh, make the decision to run, I had already established myself in these spaces as a trusted voice when it came to legislation. Um, you know, being, being a trained political scientist uh, and having my master's in public policy as well, you know, lends itself to that ability to advocate as an expert. Um, but, you know, I don't think all of my advocacy was never intended to culminate in an election or in a campaign. Um, I think the opportunity presented itself and I felt like I had the opportunity to break a glass ceiling uh, as being the first um, while also representing um, an underrepresented community and making sure that young brown and black girls see themselves in their representation um, while also inspiring young women to understand that it's not a luxury to be in these spaces, spaces but rather their right. Thank you, Representative Judah. And now I'm going to go to State Representative Stephanie Luck. Um, she is the representative for House District 47 in Penrose, Colorado. She previously ran for the Colorado State Senate in 2018 and is passionate about America's founding values, particularly in education, having spent the year before her run for office teaching sixth grade. As an attorney, she's worked to strengthen nonprofit organizations and defend American constitutional rights across the state. Luck has also served as president of the Penrose Chamber of Commerce and as a community board member with Fremont County Communities That Care. Welcome, Representative Luck. Thank you, Sally. And it's great to be with all of you and an honor and privilege with the other members on this panel. So thank you for including me. My heart's desire, since I can remember as a little girl, is to see people flourish, to see them thrive. In fact, I can remember going down Nevada Avenue in Colorado Springs as about a five or six year old girl headed to daycare with my mom and seeing some homeless folks and wanting to know why exactly they, they didn't have a home and, and having conversations with my mom about how we could actually help them to have a home. And I found this beautiful pink house on Nevada that I thought for sure we could just buy this huge house and then have everyone live there. Um, so from a very young age, I have been focused on helping people, helping them thrive. And I have lived abroad for a number of years and have traveled even more extensively abroad and have seen different ways that different societies have addressed the problems that face them. So many of our problems are shared experiences across the globe. And so I've learned a lot about how we can take ideas from other cultures and other places and utilize them here to come up with creative solutions. As a result, I have a love for place. I think that each place has its own value and I love preserving that uniqueness. When I moved back to the States uh, a couple of years ago, I guess a number of years ago now, wow, time flies, uh, I started doing a number of strategic planning programs. And some of those things were brought me internationally again, based off of my prior circles, but a lot of the projects I took on pro bono were in my own community or in the communities that surrounded me. And we would sit down and we would problem solve around a particular issue impacting that community. And what I, what I discovered was that what was going on at our state level really hindered a lot of the 
creative and innovative ideas that people were throwing on the table in our local communities. And so I just decided that it was important to run and to have conversations here in Denver about ways we could release people to walk in that innovation and uniqueness so that we could preserve place, we could come up with different solutions that would address each individual community, but that also was ensuring that, that everything was being taken care of in the way that it should. When I ran in 2018, I lost. Obviously, I'm not a senator. I'm not here as a senator. I'm here as a representative. I, I lost that race, but I learned a lot about how, how unified we really are as a people. So I didn't go through the initially, I didn't go through the caucus process of the parties. I decided that I wanted to petition on and I wanted to go door to door and I wanted to meet the people in my district and have, have conversations about what their hearts were saying and what they were desiring. And what I found was that whether I talked to an unaffiliated individual or a Democrat or Republican, really we were all on the same page. We all wanted basically the same thing. And that was inspiring to me because at the time, especially we were hearing about these polarization and just discovering in my own community and my own district that that wasn't really the case. And then being able to link those folks together and say, hey, you're passionate about education. I just met Joe three blocks down, he also is, is passionate about the same thing. Let me connect you. And we started to see a surge of community activity because of those connections. And so when running for office, there's so many opportunities for us to do more than just have our name placed on a ballot. There's a lot of opportunity to really connect people and encourage them and give them hope that things can change and that if they just take up the initiative and take up the passion that they have, there really can be a lot of advancements made. So um, then I ran again in, in 2020, and obviously this time I was successful in that bid. And since then I've, I've been thrown into this house in this chamber and have loved a lot of it and have also honestly been grieved by a lot of it. And I think as women, we tend to be much more relational and we tend to want, um, whole and healed relationships. And politics, as we've done over the last number of years, doesn't really lend itself to that. And so I have taken on a, a project, a challenge to try to help my colleagues uh, interact with each other first and foremost as inherently valuable people and to build those strong relationships. And as was pointed to by my colleagues, you know, when we have that and we have those focuses, we can get so much more done uh, if we set a lot of that political framework aside and, and really look at each other as people, look at each other's ideas as valuable, even if we disagree with them, and try to move forward in a way that is best for the people that we serve. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Luck. Some great words, and we pre I appreciate everybody's comments. So now we're going to go to Liz Hensley, who is city councilor in Alamosa. Um, Liz was originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, but has lived in the San Luis Valley for 20 years. She is the department chair and professor in the School of Business at Adams State University. She's passionate, passionate about her students and her community and has found her true calling. She loves being part of Adams State, Alamosa, and the San Luis Valley. She graduated with her PhD in organization management from Capella University and her MBA from Arizona State University. Liz currently serves as immediate past president for the Colorado Municipal League Executive Board, Alamosa City Council member, board member on the Golf Board, Marketing Board, and the San Luis Valley Housing Coalition. Is there anything you haven't done? <laughs> and is a member of the Kiwanis International. She and her husband, Lynn, have four children, Aaron, Sammy, Chelsea, and Alan, four grandchildren, and three dogs and three cats. So welcome, uh, Councillor Hensley. Well, thank you very much. And I also would like to thank El Pomar, their par the partners. Um, I'm honored to be with each and every one of you. And I do think this is a very important topic. Um, I guess I'll start off uh, a little bit with my history is I sort of look at it that I had three careers. And so back in California, I was a manufacturer sales rep and honestly was pretty successful, did well. The industry really changed. Um, a lot of things happened in my life. And so I sort of started over and I came to Colorado. And at that point I was a single mom with my uh, with two daughters and started getting into the restaurant business, uh, the hospitality business. I 
started as sort of assistant managing before I knew it, I was running and then started a few different restaurants and bars um, in the community and then decided it was time to go back to school. So I was actually a non-traditional student, went back, did my undergraduate. And then once I do anything, I get committed to it and decided that I would continue on, do my master's and PhD. Um, and so I was doing that while I was working full time and then started doing some adjunct work here at Adams State. And here I am now. What, how I got into politics, I had no desire whatsoever. I don't, I don't think it was even a vision for me um, to be in politics or government. And what happened was I was getting more involved. I was in Kiwanis. I was definitely one of those people who, uh, when I saw a cause or something I believed in, I just jumped in and did it. And so Gigi Dennis, who is now um, our uh, county, uh, on our, uh, sorry, county commissioners, um, uh, gosh, I'm blanking out. Anyway, Administrator. Been, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and then Kathy uh, Rogers, who was our mayor at the time, both separately reached out to me and said I should run for city council. And I honestly, I was like, I don't even know what that entails. And so learn more about it. And at the time, it just wasn't a good time. I was finishing up my PhD. And so, but it made me think. And so I had two years to think about it. And so when the next election came up, I decided I did a lot of research. I thought, you know, I think this is something that would really, uh, I think I could bring a lot to my community and I could learn a lot. I love to continue to learn. So I did run and I did win. And it was all about networking. It was meeting people. It was really that idea of listening. I think listening is super important. And what is it that people wanted and what were they looking for? Um, and so I feel like that's what I brought to the position. The other thing is I got really involved with CML right in the beginning. Colorado Municipal League is awesome. And so since I was so new to this, I needed to learn a lot and CML does a really good job. So I got really engaged and I loved all the training I got through CML. Well, before I knew it, I was so um, excited about that. When uh, they had a position, I decided to run. So I ran and was on the executive board and then worked my way through and ran um, for secretary, treasurer, and then vice president and president. The thing about that that is awesome and what I would say to everybody that's, that is very important is networking. I listen, I learn from everybody. I continue to grow and learn. Um, and I come into things open-minded. I really do. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna say you never have an opinion or an idea, but I'm also willing to listen. And sometimes I'll hear something and I'll be, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I'll revisit everything. And there's times I will, I'll adjust my path because of things that I listen and hear. And so I think that for me is something I really bring to the table. You can't please everybody all the time. Um, obviously, when you have your ward or you have your constituents, you're not everybody's going to be pleased. But if you listen and truly then come through, what I try to do is then take everything I've heard, done my research, and then come in with what my I feel is my um, sort of thought from what everybody has said and bring that and stand, stand firm to that. But at the same time, if you hear something else, that idea, I don't want to say I'm wishy-washy, but that idea of being adaptable. And so that's where I'm at now. And thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor um, Hensley. Um, I think that your, your suggestion too for involvement and taking away little tidbits from each of the places you go can be very valuable. So we had uh, quite a few questions that came in in advance and I, I kind of was looking through here and I selected a couple that I think are, are really relevant in our current uh, time frame of certainly our country and our state. So what role, and I'll start with Congresswoman Deget, if you can just um, try and keep it a minute or two, but what role for social media do you foresee playing in the future of younger generations running for office? And on that um, caveat, do you think future senators or representatives will have to be social media influencers to win elections? So Congresswoman Deget? Well, obviously this is something I've really seen change during my career is the influence of social media. And I do think it's important for everybody to communicate with their constituents on social media. I'd, I'd really be interested to know what some what these new members 
uh, these new legislative members think about that because uh, because social media sort of came along after I had already been in in Congress for many years. And so I've I've had to play, you know, I've had to play catch up with it. I will say this, though. Um, I think social media is really beneficial in being able to communicate with large groups of people, but I also think that it can be very detrimental because it it um, allows people to um, to have a very shrill uh, tone and to appeal to the worst instincts. Something that you heard from every single person on this panel is is and I and I think women do it best, frankly, is all of us think we're where we are today because of our interpersonal relationships, working with people across the spectrum, across the political aisle, and and in every aspect. Social media doesn't really lend itself to that. And so I think we need to continue to find ways uh, like Representative Locke and Jodar talking about, and also Councillor Hensley are talking about, of having that important personal contact as well as getting messages out on social media. Thank you. Representative Judah, would you like to tell us your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's, Social media is one of those things. It's a curse and a blessing, right? Um, I absolutely think the Congresswoman is right. It's such a great way to communicate with constituents, with community, um, you know, and I can think of countless examples of, of how we do, we, how we did that. Um, I think technology in general, right? This little computer that we have in our hands and in our pockets, um, I would say, oh my gosh, easy 95% of my fundraising for my campaign was through texts. Um, and it worked for, for my campaign, you know? Um, I think the curse in all of this is that you do have folks who feel like they can um, have the safety of being behind a screen and not um, understand the etiquette of social media and use um, harmful and hurtful uh, words to attack uh, public figures. Um, and whether it's because we're women in politics, whether it's because we have an R or a D next to our name, uh, whether it's because of a piece of legislation, regardless of our affiliation, um, if it's for me, my faith or heritage has also been attacked, um, you know, and and there there I think um, is a huge of uh, um, uh, dance to dance when it comes to social media and how not to engage in the negativity, um, but to really embrace the positivity and use that as motivation. Great, Representative Luck. I I have a love hate relationship with social media. <laughs> And I think in many ways, I hate it more than I love it. I think that obviously, as has been said, it's a valuable tool. It's a valuable tool to get out key messages quickly. But in our day and age, isolation and loneliness is such a huge issue, especially in a, in a district like mine, which is largely rural. And so I like to utilize social media. I like to utilize those types of platforms as a, a jumping off point to actually develop real community, to actually develop face-to-face -face community and to try to facilitate interactions within my district that allow people to connect one-on-one. -on -one. Now that's gonna be different for those types of more urban areas. You know, in rural Colorado, we still have the, the phone tree, right? Um, in some ways you're gonna get information spread faster through that old school phone tree where so-and-so calls two people who calls two people who calls two people than you are in in a Facebook or Instagram and especially as our social media platforms continue to diversify and people are on a variety of them I think that that diversification is going to make it more and more challenging for for leaders to connect with the fullness of their district and so for me I'm trying to figure out ways in which to help people to maintain real personal connections so that they're engaging with each other face to face while at the same time being able to get out those informational points that need to be get out, getting out, got out. Sorry, poor grammar. Um, don't tell my sixth graders um, in, um, in, more, in more 
quick means. So do I think that in the future we're going to see shifts? Do I think that that's going to become more of a dominant platform or, or means to getting people elected? Yeah, I think that's possible. I also think it's possible that we might see that pendulum swing back and people get off of those platforms and go back into, especially after COVID, when, when people are craving interpersonal communication and sitting across the table once again and, and breaking bread and, and having real relationships, I think we might see that pendulum swing. But as Councilman Hensley say, you just said earlier, you just have to be adaptable. You have to take it as it comes and try to use the best tools available to you to get out your message and to try and encourage people to live more full and, and abundant lives. Thank you, City Councilor Hensley. So um, ironically, as I teach social media marketing, I have for the last 10 years. And so what I, I feel like I brought to the table, um, so even when I was campaigning, I do think Facebook, Instagram, all of that was a compliment. I still knocked on the doors. I still, again, that idea of that interaction is very important, but I did take advantage of social media. And I think, you know, you look at the youth now, um, they have all been brought up on it. It's something that is part of their norm for, I think most of us here, it was something we had to adapt and learn. <laughs> um, and that it, you know, obviously all those things that we've learned as we've gone through our stages of life. But I look at the college kid, the college students, the, I mean, even young twenties, my, my kids are between the ages of 28 and 30, 36. And they honestly have sort of been brought up with social media as well. And so I think it's going to be something that is more of the norm as we continue to go forward. And every time there's something new, whether it be Snapchat, all the different things that are out there, and it's going to continue to grow. But I agree that we need to have the um, that combination. And I do think that pendulum will go back and forth. I even noticed that in the classroom where students used to be like, oh, I have to come to class. And now because of COVID and now not going to class and now ex how excited some of them are to be able to come back to class. I think they appreciate it more. Um, and I think I would say, since there's some youth that are watching this, I, one of the things I would say if I was to pick something out that I teach in class is um, it is something you need to be very careful on social media. We tend to vent a lot on social media. Um, and so one of the things that I would always say is if you're going to put it on social media, would you want it on the front page of the newspaper? And that idea there of whatever you say, whatever you do, is it something, whether it's a tweet, Snapchat, anything, even though you think it disappears, it doesn't. And so that idea, would you want that on the front page of the paper and sort of live that life? That's, that's actually a really good piece of advice for anybody wanting to run for office for anything they do in their life. And it's something that I have been learning again lately, far too many of my male colleagues don't seem to remember that when they're taking actions in their personal lives. It's not just the men, but it's disproportionately the men. Great, great information. And I, I remember when we were dealing with some horrific wildfires in El Paso County, uh, one of the things that I did was I was sending out updates on Twitter and that actually the news media was following that to get information. So it can be a valuable tool, but it can also, it also has to be managed carefully, I agree. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought this, this um, was a really interesting question that someone sent in. What is the best advice you could offer for women leaders to remain calm and collected in a male dominated environment during a heated debate or discussion while remaining passionate. And uh, Congresswoman, we'll start with you. Well, so, so of course there's um, oftentimes a double standard about debate, right? Because if a male politician is passionate about something he just feels strongly and if if a woman is making the same type of argument within the same uh in the same way she's um emotional right so you know you, you have to think about being able to present your case and i know uh, representative luck you're a lawyer too i had many years of of and, and actually everybody here has had many years of working in male dominated professions. 
And we have had to make presentations. And I think I don't think women should ever shy away from presenting their case quite strongly. One thing I do try to do is I, I do try to avoid becoming emotional. And sometimes it's not easy. Um, you know, we have we have terrible things that happen and we're talking about them. But um, but I try to be if I'm if I'm passionate and I frequently am, I try to be um, I, I try to be level headed. And, and like the others here, at least from what I've heard, I try to present my argument and and the facts and not engage in ad hominem attacks. And I, um, one of the things I frequently do um, on the floor, some of you may have seen me from time to time, Speaker Pelosi asks me to preside over the house as the speaker pro tem. And so I've presided over many hot floor debates. And I find the most effective speakers are always the speakers who speak from the heart, but do, who are not attacking their opponent. And so I try to I try to model that in my own behavior. But I don't think women should hold back from being strong advocates simply because of their gender. Uh, one one other thing I'll say is is um, I've I've started trying to figure out ways to call out. Uh, sexist remarks when people do it without without being confrontational. So so if somebody says, you know, oh, I saw you were emotional in that last speech, then I'll say, yeah, and you were pretty emotional in your last speech too, or you know, something something to just you know not give them a pass on that, but also not to uh, not to um, get too get too hung up on the ad hominem attacks. Great, thank you. Representative Judah? You know, um, there was uh, and continues to be many instances where this occurs, right? And uh, we, we as women need to lift the veil on the reality of uh, sexism in the workplace. Um, uh, one time I was teaching um, a class about uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I got to my Gaza unit and I had 78 people in class and someone stood up and said, I don't believe what you're saying. And my expertise, my lived experience, everything uh, in the subject didn't matter in that moment. And then a white Christian man stood up in front of the class and said, I'm a doctor with Doctors Without Borders. And I was in Gaza during the Gaza incursion and I can vouch for what she's saying. He used his privilege to in that moment, give me credibility and legitimacy something I knew I already had, but I needed someone who could again, use their privilege to do that. It happened just last week with a lobbyist. Uh, I was in a room with four men and one of the lobbyists did not acknowledge me in the room as a representative. And uh, someone in a position of influence called him out on it privately. And you know, it, he was a white man and he said, uh, and later that lobbyist texted me and, and sincerely apologized. Um, and he was embarrassed and, um, uh, uh, you know, is, is really hoping to smooth over the, for future relationships and working together. And so um, sit in your power, ladies. You know, if you plan to go into this work, people will um, want to tear you down. You will be hysterical when you get emotional. You will not you know, viewed as someone who uh, is passionate about this issue or has a lived experience and narrative that is valid. Um, I distinctly remember as a little girl under 10 being told a woman can never be president. Can you imagine if she had the nuclear codes while she was on her period? Someone literally told me this and I had never forgotten that because um, it didn't reconcile in my brain. <laughs> um, and so, there are um, times, and I think the Congresswoman is exactly right. Uh, you, you have to sit in your power, sit in your knowledge and your expertise, and always make sure you know the, the stats and figures you can lean on so you can debunk those, uh, uh, those arguments that are attacking you simply because of either your gender or your passion for the issue. Thank you. Representative Luck. 
Thank you, Sally. And thank you, ladies, for your comments. I, I think I'd like to actually, um, because of what you guys have already shared, I, I don't know that I have that much to add, but I would like to give a shout out to all of the women who have come before. So in the Colorado State House of Representatives, women are now in the majority. We have, there are more women in the House than there are men. And I know that that was hard fought that there were a lot of battles that took place in order for that to take to happen. And I, I have a dear mentor, uh, she's a lawyer who, she was one of the first three at her law school, first three women at her law school. And many of her professors would go between, would rotate between men and women on, in their Socratic questioning in class time. And so obviously in a class of 30, there are only three women, um, they're constantly on call and all, all of her experiences that she shared with me just reminded me of the sacrifices that so many women had to make in order for me now to sit in this place and it not be an anomaly, for me not to be one of three, but to be in the majority. That was a lot of hard fought battles. She experienced all sorts of hostility and admonition from her, her faculty members and from her fellow classmates and yet I think she was one of the top people who graduated in her law school and so I just want to take this time to say you know while there may be areas we still have to grow there's been so much work that's been done and we need to honor those women in our lives who stood in the gap for us to make that path easier for us to walk. Thank you City Councilor Hensley. I think also everybody has said a lot and I I agree and I could tell my own stories to similar things. One thing I, um, so I'm also first generation American, but my parents are both from England. And one of the things my, I, my dad in particular, I often would said, cause he really, my mom became a citizen, but my dad did not. And I often said to him, I said, if you love England, why did you stay here? And he honestly, he said, because I have children and you all have a better chance to do whatever you want to do in life here in the United States. And so I always kind of believed I could do anything. And um, I think, so what I, I feel is that we also as women need to support each other. I sometimes see situations where um, you've got to, females and they're not supporting each other. There's sometimes friction there. And so I think that's one of the things I've seen is just to really support each other. We don't necessarily have to agree with everything that um, we necessarily stand for, but to support each other as leaders um, and to be there and, and stand together. And then the other thing in regards to that, it is sometimes challenging. I see that especially if somebody is very um, passionate about what they're saying and you're right, if, if a female says one thing and a male says it, it's interpreted as two different things. And that idea, it tends to be more negative in regards to if the female has that passion versus the male. And, but I, I'd like, I mean, it's, we're definitely not over the hump, but I, it, one of the things, um, Representative Joda, is that when you've told me a couple of those stories, that is so awesome that people are standing up and helping to support. And I think we need to, everybody needs to do more of that. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes left and I wanna give everybody a chance to kind of get their closing thoughts in, but I think a good question to really end upon um, is you know, what is the best advice that you received when running for office or what advice would you give to those running for office? And feel free to share kind of your closing thoughts, knowing that a lot of the folks who are listening will be thinking about running for office or may actually be running now. So Congresswoman, we'll start with you. Thank you, Sally. Well, let me say, first of all, uh, I've done a number of panels like this over my career. And, and this is by far and away is the very best one I've ever done because we have such a diversity of individuals and geography and ages here, but we all share common thoughts. And I don't know about, about all of you and, and you're included in this, Sally, I'd love to all get together in person sometime and do, do this because I think we could, we could inspire each other a lot. So thank you for doing this. Um, in terms of it, the, the, the foundation of advice I would give to women thinking about running for office is this, just do it. Because so often, um, I, I see this all the time with Congress, women think, oh, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not qualified to run for whatever it is. 
But men, and, and I, I joke about this all the time, you know, women look in the mirror and they go, oh, I don't know. Men look in the mirror and they see the president of the United States, you know, uh, and, and I serve with so many, the women are always so highly qualified, which frankly makes them in many ways better legislators, which is why they're so successful at all levels of government. But, but uh, women are really um, still hesitant to do it. And I, I have women, uh, women thinking about running say to me, oh, I just wouldn't want to have the, I, I wouldn't want to be in the public eye that much. And I always say to them, well, I don't know what you do in your private life, but I'm going to guarantee you that it's not as bad as many of the male candidates. And if you have a passion for what you're doing, and if you're doing this for a good reason, that will come out. People will see that. And voters tend to trust women candidates more than they trust male candidates because they know women are coming from a position of deep passion for the for the issues that they care about. Um, you know, fundraising is always a challenge for women, but now many organizations have sprung up by, on both sides of the aisle to help women candidates. And that is a place, uh, Representative Joda, where, where I think the online um, fundraising has really helped for women because it lets people raise money in small contributions, not from uh, not large contributions from male lobbyists as much. And so, so, uh, the, and the last thing I'll say is I know a lot of women who wait to raise their families before they run for office, and that certainly is a um, a road to take and an important road to take. But the other road to take is uh, like so many of my younger colleagues is just to do it when the opportunity arises. And that's why I always tell people about the ages of my daughters when I first ran. It was very unusual back then. Now it's not nearly as unusual. I have a number of colleagues in Congress, men and women who have young children. And, and, and what I say is this, you know, if we don't, I mean, Colorado, kudos to the Colorado legislature, because now we do have a majority of women, and it was hard fought to get that majority. In Congress, we still only have 25% of women. And uh, I will say now, of course, our speaker is a woman. We have women who are the chairs of some important committees, including the Appropriations Committee, um, including uh, the small business community uh, committee and the banking committee. So, so women are, are moving up, but until we get, um, but you know, Congress at least is all seniority. And so until we get a critical mass of younger women raising families, then we'll never have that critical mass of leaders in Congress. And it's like Nancy Pelosi always says, you want to be in the room. Of course, that was made f famous in Hamilton, too. Um, you need to be in the room when those decisions are make, being made, and women need to be in the room. And the last thing I'll say, if you do decide to have a family in this job, um, you have to find a partner who is fully supportive of what you're doing. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just close with one story. When I was in the legislature, I had a colleague. She was incredibly talented and she had a really bright future ahead of her. She had a very young child and her husband, an attorney said to her, I think that's great that you run for office, but I need dinner on the table at six o'clock every night and you have to figure out the child care. Well, she lasted one term because she couldn't figure out how to do it. So that's just not, you know, so you, my husband has been supportive at every step of the way. He's my biggest supporter. And, um, I, and so that's the, that's the advice I give to people running. But you know, if you've got that passion, just do it. That's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. And we're getting pretty close here to the to the top of the hour. Um, so Representative Judah. You know, this is actually very serendipitous for me that you asked this question. Literally almost a year ago, it's been a year, um, there was an Ignite event for women in politics and Congresswoman Deget spoke. And she said, and I will never forget this, 
she said, uh, ladies, uh, tell your partners that they better get really used to making mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and I never forgot that congresswoman. And it's because I went home and I told my husband that. Um, and, and I do think that, you know, you're absolutely right. Having a partner who is incredibly supportive of this path will um, make it easier for you. I think um, as, as, as long as I've been under that dome working in an advocacy role, uh, being on the other side of that bench, it, it's, it's, it's taxing. Um, there are, you know, days where you are so emotionally drained and you don't have the bandwidth. Um, and so making sure that you have a support system, a great piece of advice I had uh, and got, and I, and I very much implement was have your political friends and have your non-political friends. So these are my non-capital friends. And I, it's good because these non-capital friends, I don't have to talk policy. I don't need to talk about my bills. I don't have to talk about nothing. I can talk about all the fun things, right? And that's that's really important is to maintain a healthy balance of of, of your social, you know, lifestyle, uh, your self care, right? So for me, that's where that cooking and family time and fly fishing and um, that's where that comes in for me. Um, while while understanding the awesome responsibility that we shoulder as legislator legislators. Um, I will, I will end by saying uh, I ran to make the American dream a reality for everyone. I'm the product of the American dream, right? But that is not a trite or cliche phrase for, for me and for many people. Um, and, and knowing that American dream is becoming harder and harder to realize, we as women, I think especially as women, have an obligation to community to make sure that we can create a space where that American dream can come to reality and it's not a dream anymore, right? And so uh, I wanna make sure that future generations have, have the ability to do that by um, again, following the advice of those that came before us. And, and like Representative Luck said, uh, uh, really set the tone for what's, what's, what's uh, capable for women in government. So we're running out of time. Um, I'm sorry, Representative Luck and, and City Councilor Hensley. Uh, we appreciate all of you. I know that um, some will be joining us in the breakout sessions as well. So there'll be more time to uh, talk in the, maybe those breakout sessions, but we appreciate all of you um, to go ahead and, and give us and share with everyone your take on women in politics. Um, I think that um, I think that this has been a great session and have appreciated everybody being part of this today. And um, Congresswoman, I, I would love to get together and have this same group meet because there's a lot that I'd like to contribute as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Briefly, I just again want to thank you, Sally, for moderating. What amazing insights from our panelists. Um, and thank you to our friends and partners at the Colorado Municipal League, as well as Colorado 5050. And, and at El Pomar specifically, I wanna thank a few key folks. Uh, Megan Sanders, uh, amazing job trying to get everyone together in a virtual environment. So well done, Megan. She was supported by some uh, good fellows, uh, colleagues, Hannah Grace, Claire, Adelita, Danielle, and Will. So thanks all for your support and assistance. And we look forward to connecting with everyone in our breakout sessions. Thank you all. Thank you.